Want to know how adrenals and different hormones like estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, and cortisol affect your bones, your health, and your general well-being? Then you're going to want to stick around for this episode with Marcel Pick. She's a nurse practitioner, a, an author of multiple books. She's also a functional medicine practitioner. She's been featured on ABC, Fox, Dr. Oz, and she's been working in women's healthcare for decades. She's got so much knowledge and experience. I think you're going to learn so much. So you're going to want to stick around for this episode. Before you do, before we get into the episode, I want you to do two things. So if you haven't done so already, click that red button below that says subscribe so you never miss an episode that can help you improve your bone health. And then also click below, there's a link that goes to bonecoach.com so you can download your free seven-day osteoporosis kickstart guide. You'll be glad you did. Now, let's get on to the show. So we have Marcel Pick. She is an OBGYN nurse practitioner and a functional medicine practitioner. She's passionate about transforming the way women experience healthcare through an integrative approach. She co-founded the world-renowned Women to Women Clinic in 1983 with the vision to not only treat illness, but also support her patients in proactively making healthier choices to prevent disease. She successfully treated thousands of individuals through her unique approach to wellness. She's currently an educator with the Institute for Functional Medicine. So she's actually training and educating this new line of practitioners that are coming in for root cause medicine. She is served as a medical advisor for multiple magazines. Uh, she's got the author of three different books. She has appeared on Dr. Oz, Fox, ABC, uh, and a whole host of magazines. And she has her own PBS special called Is It Me or My Hormones? It is absolutely amazing, Marcel, what you have been able to accomplish in your career in women's health. And I am thrilled and honored to have you on the podcast and this show. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled actually to be here. The more we can get this information out, the better. I, I wholeheartedly agree. So before we get into anything else, I actually wanted to ask you, um, you know, you've been in, in women's health for a long time, obviously. What was the impetus for you starting down the path and why is this a great passion of yours today? Mm -hmm. Well, I have an interesting story. I actually was born in Australia in the outback and I spent much of my time. We, we really, I mean, I didn't have, I didn't have to flush a toilet until I was 11 and we, you know, I, we didn't have any stores, we didn't have any cars. We, so the real outback. Very different life. Yeah. And I spent a ton of time in the water and also in Aboriginal caves. Oh, wow. And I've known since I was a very young woman that I wanted to make a difference. And I grew up in Virginia Beach after that, and Edgar Casey's foundation was there. And we talked a fair amount about how we can look at medicine a little bit differently. And I was always a very, uh, I always spent more of my time in my books than I did anything else, just kind of trying to understand this and learn it. So I've been doing alternatives since I started. I went to a program at Harvard Med for a nurse practitioner program at the very, very outset of nurse practitioners because I wanted to get an education that would avail me um, the background to be able to also step out of the box a little bit because I had the credentials to be able to do that. Well, that's, that's a wonderful background. And, and I mean, you're beginning starting in Australia to coming here to the U.S. That, that's pretty amazing that now you've, you've launched this amazing career. You have all these different resources and you're helping so many people still around the world today. Um, I do want to talk about for a second, you have a, a book and a PBS show called, is it me or my hormones? And I actually just want to start with a very basic question because some people in our audience may not even be familiar with this. Uh, what are hormones and what role do they play in our bodies and in our bone health? So the, I know more about women, so I'm going to forgive me when I'm not addressing Absolutely. the male audience, but I, I might, women is more of a passion. So we all have hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA, and certainly human growth hormone and others as well. But we have huge fluctuations that go on in our lives because in particular of adrenal dysfunction, which I call stress. And we can have stress that actually starts when we're younger. And what's interesting is that, and I'm going to tie this into bones in a moment, but there is something called the ACE study. And the ACE study looks at if you had adverse events as a child, um, did it cause health problems later on in life? And it was a study done in 1998 by Kaiser Permanente and a guy named Valetti. 
And I had a radio show for a number of years and I interviewed him on that and I was blown away at the results. What it showed is if you have a, a quiz on a score of one to 10, you had four or more, you grew up feeling unloved, you, you had a parent that died, you had alcoholism, there was any kind of abuse in the family, including perhaps even emotional abuse. Your chances of having heart disease were 165% higher. Kidney disease, lung disease, and how does that tie into hormones? Well, guess what it does? Because if you have a lot of stress, that's actually sometimes coming from, you know, as a kid, you learned to be a perfectionist because you wanted everything to be okay in the home. You're trying to have control. That causes cortisol to be released all the time. When that happens, that actually sabotages your hormones. So we have a, um, everybody hears about cholesterol, how important cholesterol is. Well, cholesterol makes our sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA, or contributes to it, I should say, it doesn't make it. If we have too much stress for too long, it hijacks an enzyme, fancy word, 1720 lyase, and it blocks that from being converted. And what happens then is cortisol is produced. And if you have lots and lots of cortisol, you then have less progesterone. And for those women that are listening, that might mean more PMS. It might mean more irregular periods. It might mean no sex drive. It might mean having early hot flashes and night sweats. Those hormones are essential, especially for women to regulate their cycles, but also their emotions and their moods. Now, the other part to that puzzle is if we have too much cortisol, cortisol we have to have. If we don't have stress, we can't live. However, if we have too much of it, what goes on is we don't sleep. And when we don't sleep, we don't have a human growth hormone that's really important. And we also don't set bone down at night, which is very important to know as well. So if you've got too much cortisol, it also, as I said, hijacks the hormones. But in addition, cortisol, when it's up all the time, causes more inflammation. So that cascade contributes then to a digestive system that's not working properly. And therein lies a huge issue because digestion affects how we absorb nutrients. Our thyroid also gets disconnected with too much cortisol. We see that we have more autoimmune disorders and immune issues, and we have a cascade of events then that go down a path we don't want to go down. So it's gigantic, and hormones are a huge part of that puzzle. We also see that women, when they have less estrogen, have much more of a risk of developing osteopenia and osteoporosis. And we know women on hormone replacement therapy don't have that issue, so there's a connection there as well. Long-winded answer. No, no, that, that was great. Um, so generally speaking, I mean, what happens with women's hormones at each stage of menopause? Um, if you could just walk through that. Sure. So the part that's complicated is that we, we have women that are having their hormones change, and we say about 13 years before their periods stop. Well, we don't know when that endpoint is. Generally, the average age is 51.3. But prior to that, the hormones are shifting. And what we know, and what I say to people all the time, I was just on a, a, a webinar the other day, is that if we have too much stress, it absolutely exacerbates that shift that happens faster because of that shift that happens because of that enzyme. So I always start with adrenals first. When I'm looking at somebody that has PMS or something called postpartum depression or PMDD, which is much more significant than just PMS, very severe depression and possibly even suicide, I start looking at adrenals early on. And as we correct that, then the hormones can stabilize themselves a little bit more. So we have the early menopausal years, you know, 13 years before that hormones are shifting. And then we start to have more shifts happen around the age of 48, 49, and 50. However, we are seeing now more than ever before, younger women going into early menopause, and that's before, you know, from 40 to 50, that's called early menopause. The unfortunate part is we're also seeing something called premature ovarian failure. Horrible name, it's like the ovaries prematurely failed, I mean, spare me. But we're seeing with the amount of toxicity we have in our culture, that we are seeing that probably exacerbating um, the hormonal you know, hijacking that happens. But we're also starting to see that it's an autoimmune disorder. You do see it in families, and there's a relationship between um, that issue, and there are tests that we can do to see if that's a problem for, for young women, if, especially if they have a family history. I'm gonna be someone then will say, look, I think it's a really good idea for you to actually freeze some eggs, so that if you want to have some 
you know, leader if it becomes a problem that you have them. So there's many layers to this, you know, stress being one. We also have what we call, you know, toxicity. The average newborn has 287 chemicals in its cord blood. The average baby that's breastfed 150 chemicals in the breast milk is like, oh my God, what have we done? So I'm suggesting for people all the time, I'm sure you are as well too, Kevin, that the cleaner your diet is, the better. Keeping away from pesticides, artificial colors, sweeteners, dyes. If a food stays on a counter for 24 hours and it doesn't have some resemblance of not looking so good, probably shouldn't have it. So those are kind of you know, hallmarks. And what's interesting now with the episodes that are going on in our lives, we always see the vegetables and the fruits and all those are full. And many of the other, you know, um, things are kind of more empty right now with this episode that we're having going on. But um, our world needs to change how we eat our food and the foods that we consume on a daily basis. And then, then just, uh, so once, once a woman hits menopause, uh, and or is postmenopausal? What's happening with her hormones at at that point? Uh, because I know a lot of our audience is actually in that in that stage. Sure, absolutely. So what's happening is that our and here's the part that's so interesting is adrenals. You know those small glands that sit on top of the kidneys that we hardly ever talk about um, unless somebody's very seriously got Cushing's or or Addison's disease. Those adrenal glands um, help in the production of estrogen and progesterone. 15% of the production. Postmenopause, they're required to produce about 30%. Still not enough, still not a lot, but they are still part of that cascade, in addition to helping with fluid balance and in addition to helping with glucose control and many other characteristics. So what's really important to know is that the production of the hormones goes down pretty significantly. So you have much lower estrogen, much lower uh, progesterone, much lower, and for some if they've had too much stress going on for too long, DHEA, which is the feel-good hormone. And all of that then can set the stage up if you're not doing regular exercise and weight, you know, weightlifting and not eating a really good diet and don't have a good digestive system, that can contribute pretty significantly to changes in the bone. But quite honestly, what I know is that those changes have probably been going on for a while. We just never test them. We never really find out about it until we're doing you know, bone densities. And then we're like, oh my God. And it probably was there all along. We just didn't know it. What are the in, I mean, what are the indicators then at that point where where you may not been may not have been having any testing done for hormones at all, but there may be a need. What what are some indicators that there should be some testing done and, and maybe something needs to be addressed? Sure. That's a really, really complicated question because we know from the study that was done in 2001 that they looked at prior to that time, anybody should have been on hormone replacement therapy. If you didn't put people on hormone replacement therapy, it was malpractice. 2001, this large study came out looking at 16,000 women, most of them menopausal, by the way, and I'll come back to why that's important to know. And what they found is we can't use hormones. And they were using what's very important is something called Prempro, which is synthetic estrogen from the urine of, of um, horses, and also progestogen, which is not the same as progesterone. And that combination increased the risk of stroke, blood clots, heart disease. The information on osteoporosis was kind of varied, and also then uh, breast cancer. When they took the progestogen out of that combination, they found that yes, perhaps it, it increased your risk of breast cancer, but not as much. So that study created havoc in the world of, of my world, and no one was gonna be, everybody was taken off hormones like overnight. And what happened then is many people were symptomatic. We had so many symptoms and we started then putting people on antidepressants to help with the hot flashes. That did nothing for the bones, of course. And now we're starting to come back full circle. You know, we have an extreme reaction, we have an overreaction, and now we're coming midway, understanding that, guess what? Hormones do help bones. And they are so if you have somebody on a transdermal, either estrogen or um, a cream or a melt, which is what I use, those women are having less osteoporosis because we're adding in the estrogen. So if somebody doesn't have a family history of breast cancer and they don't have, um, they're you know, having symptoms of 
um, menopausal symptoms that are pretty significant, I do use bioidentical hormone replacement therapy with a caveat that we're talking every single year, helping them understand that they still have some kind of a risk profile. So using hormones is something that I do do. And I think the criteria for women is I've changed my diet. I've really looked at my stress. I've addressed my stress. I've done an adrenal you know, uh, complex saliva-wise to see what my cortisol levels are. We've addressed that with supplements. And I'm, st and I'm doing exercise and I'm still symptomatic. Either I'm concerned about bones because everybody in my family has osteoporosis and I want to do something or I want to get rid of the menopausal symptoms. So you're, you're mentioned one test in, uh, one test in there, the, the salivary cortisol for adrenal function. Um, any other testing that you think would be important for someone to get when they're trying to figure out what their hormone levels look like? What are the really important, accurate tests? So here's the part that's important to know, and that is that anybody that's menopausal is going to have their hormones tanked. I mean, it's unlikely unless somebody's got some significant weight, body fat, because that produces estrogen. And then those people in particular, it's going to be very important that somebody do test their levels because the estrogen progesterone balance may be off, which contributes, unfortunately, to uterine cancer. So I think if somebody's interested in kind of pursuing what do I need to do to feel better, I'd start with the adrenal profile, a cortisol you know, evaluation, look at the Institute of Functional Medicine, find a practitioner that's actually certified in functional medicine because they have some more experience, and they can actually have that testing done. And then in terms of hormones, everybody's going to have low hormone levels. So the question is, are you interested in doing something about balancing those hormones back? Because if you're not, it's pointless. You know, we're not going to really be able to do anything. We do know that a whole foods diet, a diet with wild yams and a, and a balanced, colorful diet is going to make a, a difference in terms of the production of hormones. Really working on stress. And I, don't, I mean, we all have stress. That's not the point. The point is how do we learn to manage it? I was on the call this morning with my daughter who's, you know, freaking out because she's in DC. She just got laid off and she's in medicine and she's trying to figure out what to do. And the point for me was, look, put that on the shelf for right now. There's nothing you can do about it. If you want to spend an hour a day worrying about it, go for it. But the rest of the time, it's time to kind of figure out how you can really enliven your life. And this is an amazing opportunity for so many of us to go inside and look at the deeper, bigger questions about you know, my life and how do I want it to be in a different way, which includes if you have bones that are weak, how can you strengthen yourself on many different levels? Because that's also symbolically what bones are about. I wholeheartedly agree. No, I talk about that all the time. Strength of body, strength of mind, strength of bone. Um, so you mentioned uh, something in there about the you know, diet obviously has an impact on, on hormone levels. I know you mentioned wild yams and are there other natural ways to help balance your hormones and what would those ways look like? Mm -hmm. So much of it is really about a whole foods diet. So it's having foods that are colorful on your plate. It's using things like wild yams and nuts and seeds and, you know, some of the better juices that are not sweet necessarily, but have spinach and collards and those kinds of things in it that will also help. The part that's going to be so important, though, is to understand that if people don't have a digestive system that works really well, it's pointless in some ways um, because the body doesn't absorb the nutrients. And that's another key important factor is making sure the digestive system's really good. I would say 80% of my patients in my practice, and I've been in practice for over 33 years, have had digestive issues. That's a huge number of people that then are not absorbing the nutrients well. They've either got bloating or constipation or diarrhea, and they don't, they are always complaining. So going also there to make sure that that digestive system's working, that enhances then the nutrient absorption, that that also you know, catapults somebody into having better health for their bones as well. And what are the... So, so not even focused on the, the natural route, somebody decides, okay, I do need hormone therapy in, in some form. What do those forms look like? And could you talk a little bit about the different forms and and sure. So we've we've talked for years about bioidentical hormones. And bioidentical hormones simply means we're using a hormone that's very similar to what we produce ourselves. We have three different types of estrogen. We have something called estrone, we have estradiol, and we have estriol. For years in the, in the kind of alternative community, we talked about using bi or triest 
I never use triass because estrone is a hormone most of the hormones get converted to anyway. So I sometimes will use biased and sometimes I'll use straight estradiol. It comes in many different forms for those that, that treat with bioidentical. I use patches a lot of time and the reason for that is it's covered by insurance. So you can get something called the Minivel dot, you can get something called the Vivel dot, which are tiny. And there's very, there's very, you know, amounts you can get 0.025, you can get 0 0.0375, 0 0.05, 0 0.075, and then 0.1. And I usually start on the lower end, but we always have to use a progesterone with it. If we look at the conventional world, they'll use Provera, which is a progestogen. Now, the important part about that, and I'll try to make this simple, is if we have two molecules, we have a progestogen, which is what was in that study, and many people in the conventional world use, and a progesterone, those molecules, believe it or not, are not similar to each other. And our body doesn't have an affinity to the progestogen. It does affect our biochemistry, so it decreases the chances of us, if we have a uterus, we have to be on progesterone or progestogen to make sure we don't get uterine cancer. But the problem is that they're not, they're not identical to our biochemistry. So I add progesterone or prometrium, which you can actually get over the counter. The problem is it's made in a red dye and it's made in peanut oil. And pe many people have problems with peanuts. So I tend to have it compounded at a compounding pharmacy and I tend to use either a melt and most often that is what I use because creams for some women, they, you know, there's a point in which you just don't have any more space on your body to use them. So I tend to use a fair amount. Some people also use vaginal suppositories because that's a fantastic way for you to be able to either get a, a lotion or a cream or drops. So I think it depends on your comfort level. I've used all of those in many different varieties um, and it does make a difference for bones. There's no question about it. The studies have all been showing that it's 0.05 of the patch that has been seen in the studies, but you can even go as low as 0.0375 to really help with bone um, health and, and strength. That was amazing. Very, very helpful, Marcel. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so, um, it, and even though there are specific doses out there, you know, just because you get on one dose, it doesn't mean that you can't adjust up and down, right? Based on your, Absolutely your own specific not. needs. So I'll start many times with 0 0.0375, or if I'm doing, um, you know, uh, a combination of estradiol and estriol and progesterone, I might start at a lower end and then work my way up number one, depending upon symptoms. And that is when I will do hormone evaluations. If I'm using a melt, I'll oftentimes do a saliva test. And if I'm using the patch in combination with progesterone in a tablet, I'll use um, actual blood tests, but I'll use a specific lab. I won't do generally tests in the hospital because their ranges are not you or they're not specific enough for women on hormone replacement therapy. So I'll use um, labs like uh, Genova, Doctors Data, um, many of the other companies, Diagnostex, so that I have a reference range that I can use. And then I'll look at the symptoms they have, the numbers that I have, and I'll see it several times before, you know, we'll together make a decision about how to change things. That's fantastic. And are there any specific conditions, diseases, other factors, or situations where you advise against the use of hormone therapy? Sure, if somebody's had a history of breast cancer, it's not a good idea to go on hormone replacement therapy. If they have a history of blood clots of any kind, then that would be um, not something to use. However, many of the cardiologists now, if I have a patient that has a cardiovascular issue, I will then have them go back to the docs to make sure because, because of that study in 2001, it was forbidden everywhere. Well, now the docs are starting to see the research is coming out saying, wow, Hmm, it does seem like perhaps estrogen is cardiovascularly protective. So they are now coming around saying, yeah, I think it's a good thing. Um, but we also have to understand the best time to go on hormone replacement therapy is at menopause or when you're having symptoms. The study that I referred to of 2001, many of those women were 60 and had never been on hormone replacement therapy. So if you can imagine that a cell has been kind of quiet and quiescent, and then we ramp it up with estrogen, more than likely that was another part of the puzzle that contributed to the numbers that we saw. So it's best if you're two to three years, and I would say probably more like two years around the time of menopause to introduce these. That's great. And, and what, about, um, what about lupus as a condition? Is there, are there some considerations with lupus as well? 
I wouldn't say so. I think, you know, again, what we know about lupus is it's an autoimmune disorder. So, you know, for me, the queen of adrenals, I'm always going to be looking at adrenals first to see if I can really downregulate the lupus and really convert it to the other side. We've seen enough from um, Terry Wall's research. I don't know if you know who she is, but um, of course. she teaches at the Institute of Functional Medicine with me. And, you know, we talk a lot about how we can really calm down that autoimmune response. And we see it with Hashimoto's all the time as well. So I would start with adrenals and diet aggressively, but there's no contraindication to being on hormone replacement therapy as we're really, you know, helping heal that body. That's fantastic. And so I do actually want to get to adrenals in just a minute, but, but to kind of close up what we're talking about with hormone uh, therapy, for women who are already using hormone therapy and want to stop, what can they expect when they do stop? So I'm going to say adrenals again, but that's going to be really important that they have somebody test their adrenals so that they can really support that biochemistry. And then I never have people stop cold turkey. So if somebody's on a patch, for example, of 0.05, I'll have them cut a small amount off every couple of weeks. And then they will stop the progesterone at the very end, but they don't have to stop that and they don't have to wean off that. Unless they have the melt, then I might you know, have them cut a small amount off. You want to be able to support the biochemistry of the body. You want to eat cleaner than ever before, get outside and exercise, really work on that emotional connection because the more you go down the bunny hole like my daughter did, the more you're going to have problems getting out of it. And that's going to be really important to stay above that so that the biochemistry of the body also heals. So it's just being gentle with yourself and listening. You know, am I sleeping really poorly? Well, maybe I went down too fast on that patch. And for some people, what honestly happens is it's their point of saying, I want to get off. I'm done. I, I don't want this anymore. It's just concerning to me. They get off and they come back and they go, don't you ever listen to me again. I want to stay on them. So everybody's different. They just have to understand that, it, you know, we got to figure this out together. That's great. So, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and transition to talk about adrenal health now. Uh, so you have two books on the topic, Are You Tired and Wired? And another one called, Is It Me or My Adrenals? Can you start by sharing what our adrenal glands are and how they fit into our overall health? Sure. You know, it's so interesting. We never talk about adrenals. And unfortunately, the American College of Endocrinology came out with a statement in around the time my book came out saying there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue. Well, you know, I, I think the reality is it's probably a horrible name. I mean, adrenal fatigue, it just was, you know, really capitalized on the internet. But we do know that our adrenals are crucial for our life. If we don't have adrenal function like President Kennedy, he was on medication and would have to be, you know, if he was still alive, because he can't live without cortisol. We know that in old times, many thousands of years ago, cortisol was the hormone that got upregulated pretty significantly if we had a war coming. And then our body went into what adrenals do is we don't get hungry, our bowels, you know, get all crazy, we have no sex drive, we get very thirsty, our mouth gets very dry, we get hyped up with epinephrine. And then after that crisis is over, the body calms down. The problem that's happening now for our culture is because of especially now, um, we see TV, we see wars when they happen, we're, we're on our computers all the time. The average work week is 80 hours instead of 40 hours in some places. Our whole world is exploding all the time with information. We're trying to be parents, we've got jobs, we've got relationships, we've got family, we've got friends. It's causing our adrenals to have to work much harder than they're meant to work. On top of that, if we think about the ACE study, and we have those issues, which we call imprinting in the brain, what happens then is there's a point for some people in which that rubber band that's been pulled and pulled and pulled can't do it anymore. So you'll see three types of people, and I call them, you know, uh, different names in my books. You're the person that's wired and tired, you know, or the kind of the workhorse person. You'll see the flatliner who's just exhausted or the person that's just on tilt all the time. And those people, we need to do something because ultimately what happens in my experience is that's when you see huge shifts with autoimmune disorders. And the interesting thing is about thyroid is, and unfortunately many people are not testing all the things you need to test for thyroid. If I have somebody that's very stressed, I will do the usual tests. I'll do a TSH, a free T3, a free T4. 
I'll also very importantly look at the antibodies. I might do it once just to get a sense of where they are, but then I will also do something called reverse T3. And the reason that's so important is if you have a ton of adrenal dysfunction, you have the T3 gets converted beautifully, so the T4 looks fine, the T3 looks fine, but then what happens is you've got high reverse T3, which makes the T3 inactive. So the body's behaving as though it doesn't have enough thyroid, and it doesn't. So it's very important to understand that the adrenals affect the thyroid, the immune system, the hormones, the digestive system, and also, because of that, our brain function. It's not unusual for somebody to say, I'm just so, I, I can't think, I'm so foggy headed, I'm just so confused. And that oftentimes can be from cortisol, which is an inflammatory agent. Now the beauty is we can do something about it. It doesn't require drugs, it requires some supplementation. And for me, it's one of the tests I almost never not do because I need to know people present themselves so differently. And I'm sometimes surprised as like, wow, she sounds like she's hyper and she's flatlined. Or I'll see the opposite, or I'll see high cortisols at night, all of which we can do something about. I just need to know what to do to help that particular person. And then we have to work on how did I get here to begin with, but that's a little bit later down the road. So it's not just a matter of, oh, a person has high cortisol. It's a matter of uh, you need to have cortisol in the right amounts at the right times. Correct. Because yeah. the, the levels are, and the way that our, our medical community works now is we are really looking for high, high levels, which is Cushing's, or low, low levels, which is Addison's. And in the world of medicine that we have it now, we have a bell-shaped curve. And if you are on either extreme, even if you're a point away from Cushing's or a point away from Addison's, you don't have it, you're good. It's like, what makes sense? That does not make sense. So then we have to treat it. And sometimes if people are very low, I'll use licorice. If they're very high, I'll use phosphatidylserine. And a could, could you clear that up real quick? So licorice, not, not as in you know, the licorice candy. What would be the licorice that you're talking about? Yes, um, I use deglyceride licorice. And um, the reason that that's important is because sometimes for some people it causes heart palpitations and it makes them very anxious. So what you're using is, and actually some people, if they're craving licorice, you'd, you'd kind of want to know about their adrenals actually, because they're intuitively getting a sense of, I can't get enough of that. Um, and then it comes in many combinations. Many of the you know really good quality supplement companies have licorice um, in it in combination with you know, things like cordyceps, ashwagandha, um, rhodiola, to really help those low levels come up. If you have high levels, however, that's going to give you heart palpitations because it's, you're already high and it's just going to rev you up that much more. So knowing that some people are high and then low and then high and then low also makes a difference because I'm going to intervene with them very differently. And the long-term ramifications, you know, when I first started in practice um, and I was teaching uh, on adrenals, I didn't have a lot of data, double-blind placebo-controlled studies, because I teach for IFM, we have to have those, um, showing that there was a relationship between stress and things like lupus, stress and cancer, stress and hormones, stress and um, significant digestive issues, and uh, also we're now starting association between stress and even uterine cancers, because we're looking at cortisol. So we have the data now saying that we really, really, as, as never before in our culture, we have the data to say, we have to change how we react in our lives. And it also contributes in that sense to osteoporosis as well, because it affects the digestive system and is an inflammatory agent that very much affects our bones. Absolutely. Yeah, cort cortisol, uh, if dysregulated, is definitely not good for, for bone health, too. And I actually talk about that in, a, in another episode as well. Um, so you mentioned earlier on DHEA. Uh, I do want to talk about, real quick, the role of DHEA in hormone balance and in adrenal function, if we could touch on that. It's one of my favorite hormones. You know, if I had nothing else, I would use that all the time. So when you have a low DHEA level, what I say is you get up and go is get up and gone. I'm not interested in doing this. You know, you might, and I say to people, do you want to go to the movies at night? It's like, movies? No, the couch is my friend. So I'm already suspicious. But when I see the levels, I can either do it in blood or I can do it in the saliva. If I see a level that's low, I tend to use DHEA. I'm not a big fan. And this is, you know, because I can prescribe, I, I don't uh, use over the counter. 
Generally, our body produces about 25 milligrams a day. So I'm trying to use a physiological dose. So I use a milligram per drop and I increase it generally about five milligrams twice a day. That's it. And that shifts the dynamics of the body so much. And I use it in a sublingual drop, um, usually in, in olive oil or something like that. And it works probably within two to three days to really help that level come up enough that people's sense of well-being goes up. They have much more energy. You have to be careful when you take it later in the day, because if you take it too late, like I talked to somebody yesterday, she couldn't fall asleep because she was taking it at bedtime can't take it then. So usually about two o'clock in the afternoon, but it's a game changer for people. Um, those women that have really bad PMS too, and their adrenals are really off. It can make the difference between, I don't have a life to, I have a life in a very short period of time. And is it, so before they even start supplementing with DHEA, I mean, DHEA, I know is good for bone health as well, but, um, before they even start supplementing with DHEA, should they be getting tested with a, a DHEA it would S? Be helpful. It would be helpful just to get a note. And here's the thing, you can actually get a DHEA S test done with your doctor. And that will give you an idea about what those numbers look like. Now, the problem is going to be is some of the people that are not trained in functional medicine, which means I'm not looking at the cause of the cause, they may not be as apt to want to do anything about it. So it's really the knowledge is power piece. You get the information and then you can use the resources that are available everywhere now, thank goodness, um, to help people understand what to do for themselves and to also pay attention. Okay, I took three drops twice a day and that's what I do. I actually increase the drops every four days. So I have some of my patients are only on you know, three drops twice a day. I have some that are on five twice a day. It's very dependent upon how your body responds and how you feel. We also have to understand though that DHEA can get converted to testosterone and also can increase your estrogen. So if people notice breast tenderness, they need to decrease the level. If they notice they're really irritable and angry, they need to know that they need to decrease that level because it's getting converted in the inappropriate way. Very helpful. Thank you, Marcel. And then um, <clears throat> any, any supplements, herbs, anything? I know you mentioned uh, licorice just a minute ago. Any other supplements or herbs that you think are really helpful for adrenal health? Oh, there's so many. So ashwagandha is very helpful. Uh, Siberian ginseng is very helpful. Cordyceps, rhodiola. Finding a combination, you know, and I'm a real stickler for getting good quality supplements. You know, I've been in the industry long enough that I know, and, and here's some I'm sure you've talked about, but if we get supplements that we don't know where they're from, there's many phases to development of supplements and the beginning phase is they're quarantining the raw materials. And if you have a company that's not wanting to spend a lot of money, they may use those um, raw materials without doing any quality control. And you don't want that to happen. The bad news is it's more expensive. But then you go through the, the uh, arena of they put many, many different things into that vat to make that supplement. Many people complain, well, I have to take three a day. Seriously, can't you just put it in one? Well, you can't because then you're going to push it down so tightly that when they're evaluating whether the stomach acids, because they do that for every batch in the better companies, it should be dissolved in 30 minutes. If it isn't, your body can't absorb it. So the companies that spend the time looking at and quantifying that are going to be a little bit more expensive, but it's going to be totally worth it because the other side of it means you're absorbing it and you can see the difference in how you feel. You mentioned uh, cordyceps, rhodiola, um, ashwagandha, Siberian ginseng. So what are, what are those and, and, and how do they influence you know, our, our adrenal health? I love them because they're adaptogenic. And we know from Chinese medicine for a long time that if you have a low level, you want to get the body to adapt by supporting it instead of using, I call many drugs, uh, hitting a, a, a small nail with a sledgehammer. We don't want to do that. We want to really support the biochemistry of the body. Now, what we also know is that not, not Siberian doesn't, uh, ginseng doesn't work for everybody. So sometimes we have to kind of check out some supplements that work for you because we're all different, but they work by helping the body adapt to the low or the high levels. I uh, many years ago went to Belize and we went to the um, we went on a tour um, in the uh, rainforest and when I was watching the monkeys and we had a tour guide of course and we we're talking about oh that monkey must have diarrhea it's going for that tree 
or that monkey must have blah, blah, blah. And we don't do that in medicine. We're using drugs. And the unfortunate part with that is it has many side effects. And then we have to have another drug for that side effect. And we're not dealing with the problem. And what I love about the adaptogenic herbs, which we're describing now, is they help the body adapt. They're not meant to be used long term. They're meant to be used short term as you heal the issue that got you there to begin with and take care of nutrition and take care of other things. We can't take care of the stress, but you can take care of how you respond to it. Or perhaps if you have stress in your story, I call it your history, that you may need to work around that as well at some point. I think that's great. And then, uh, you know, another area that I do want to touch on. So uh, great information on adrenal health. Another area that you help women with is weight loss, because this is something I know you have a great deal of experience. I know you've helped a lot of women over, over many years. Uh, I want to tie weight loss back to something we talked about at the beginning, though. So how can hormone imbalance affect weight loss and weight gain? So if we notice when women describe having tremendous trouble with weight, it's either, and it's not across the board true, but generally speaking, it's because they've got you know hormonal imbalance when they're younger, they got pregnant and can't lose the weight afterwards. And then the classic times that has a problem. But I also see people that have adrenal dysfunction. They're so frustrated. They're exercising more than they ever have, which they shouldn't be doing, in my opinion, if they've got adrenal dysfunction, because I don't like to see their heart rate over 90 until we heal that. They are eating less than they ever did before. They're trying every diet known to mankind, and they're not losing weight. So there are many things that cause cause what I call weight loss resistance. And that's actually the first book I wrote called The Core Balanced Diet. If you have digestive issues, we know that contributes to you not being able to lose weight. We've got study after study now looking at the microbiome. If we shift the microbiome in mice, they lose weight. Well, that's amazing. Just changing the microbiome? Are you serious? Absolutely. Now they're doing studies of obese women in Boston looking to see if they did, I know it sounds gross, but fecal implants, did it make a difference? We know that women that have pretty significant stress actually affects their hormones and they sometimes then will gain weight because the body goes into fight flight and holds on to every single calorie. We know that perimenopausally, we've got this estrogen that's here, progesterone is usually low, adrenals are usually off. That contributes then to the body being in this state of holding on to every single calorie, no matter what you're doing. Now, the other part to the puzzle is that as a culture, say one size fits all. 1,200 calories, increase your exercise, you lose the weight. I'm here to tell you that is not the truth. <laughs> and that is that we're all different. Some people need lower fat. Some people need lower carbs. You know, some people need Mediterranean, more balanced. And our culture doesn't talk about that. It's no, 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 no. And I've done it long enough that I, and I do genetic testing to see, oh, she's a low fat or no wonder she didn't lose weight. So it's also understanding that part. And in 2000, and I think it was about 2007, there was a book that came out called Diet cure and it was by Trudeau and he talked about using human uh, chorionic gonadotropin HCG which we have a lot of when we're pregnant and that transformed my thinking because what I was able to do using it I don't use it anymore is I shifted people's uh, biochemistry and metabolic function using that particular hormone the problem is it wasn't you know no everybody was using it all over the country and people then started getting even more weight loss resistance that they had before so I now use a homeopathic in my office that works incredibly well to help women shift that stuck place. And then we go right back to what kind of food do we need on the other side of this? Because women are so frustrated then they just give up. It's like, I've done everything. I've tried everything. And I'm here to tell you when you figure it out, we can get women on the other side of this. But sometimes it takes a little bit of work on our part to figure out, is it adrenals? Is it hormones? because we see it so much around pregnancy and we see it in menopause and perimenopause, that dynamic needs to shift and we can get people then to lose the weight. So there's many factors and men don't have these factors. And women are in my office with their partners and they might need to lose 10 pounds. And they look at food differently and lose the weight. And women are sitting there so frustrated because they can't. So it's just helping them figure out what the problem is so we can get them on the other side of it. 
I think that's that's fantastic that you that you do that. And I know Marcel, our time I know is coming to a close here, um, but I just want to ask: Is there anything else that you think is important to share with regards to um, hormones, adrenals, thyroid, uh, bone health specifically? So, you know, we, we touched on it and we can probably have another conversation another time. There is some interesting kind of relationship between heavy metals and, and also uh, bone issues. So that's something for people perhaps to even check with their functional medicine practitioner to look to see if there's a relationship there, if everything else you're doing isn't working to change the bones. Um, but also knowing that if you worry a lot, the worry warts that we see out there, they um, also tend to have, you know, especially the thinner women, also tend to have problems as well with, uh, with bones, so just changing that. But also know we can change anything. Once we understand what to do, we can get healthy, we can have, lose the weight, we can have energy, we can have our hormones balanced. Um, it just takes a little bit of effort and also working with someone that knows how to do it with you. I wholeheartedly agree. You know what? Marcel, I want to let our audience know where they can find you. If you, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with them, and I'm going to make sure I link to these resources in the show notes for them. Sure. So uh, they can look at marcelpick.com. I have a large website there. They can also go to womenstransformationcenter.com, which is where the weight loss component of what I do is. Um, and they can look at Women to Women Healthcare Center if they want to become a patient because I do phone consults as well and uh, from all over the country. So those are options for people. And then they can go to Amazon and get any of my books as well. That is wonderful. And Marcel, I just want to thank you again so much for taking your time Absolutely. today to talk to, to me, the audience, and, and come on the Bone Coach Podcast. And maybe we'll have you on again here sometime in the near future. Sounds great. Thanks, Thanks so Marcel. Much. Hey, thanks for tuning in for this episode of The Bone Coach Show. Hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't done so already, click that red subscribe button down there so you never miss an episode that could help improve your bone health. And then look below this episode. There are a couple links for some resources that are really going to help you along the way. So I'm your bone coach, Kevin Ellis. See you in the next episode.